Hello, everyone. I am here uh, at SoJava again. It's an honor to be here with Otavio and Barry Evans. And today, uh, we're going to talk about some Java challenge. If you weren't able to go to Java 1, we're going to and process behind the scenes. And uh, it's a great honor to be Otavio. He's, as you know, he's a Java champion and friends for all of us. He's the guy that you have to follow because he, he knows a lot and uh, he's a reference for all the Java community. And we are here also uh, with Barry Evans, uh, the Java user group. And uh, he's the Dublin Java user group leader. And uh, he's a craftsmanship. He likes a lot of clean code and he's been working with Java since 2007. And please uh, say hello, you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, it's great to be here, and it's great to uh, present the Java Challenges presentation again. We we filled it with very well at Java One, so it'll be nice to to give a bit more back to the community, and hopefully, you can all uh, learn something and enjoy the, your time with us. Yeah, could you say hello also, Tavi? Yes, yes. I'm so happy, glad to be here with you, Europe, European guys, and. Dubai Jug, right? Dubai Dublin Jug, even. Yeah. It's uh, a nice opportunity to share knowledge. I'm glad to be part of the Java community. And you forget the more important man today, the hoster, the guy behind the No Bug project. He is a smart guy. He did a lot of presentation that include on Java one. Uh, Right now, he's not Brazil anymore. He lives in Germany. <laughs> um, keep your hands together to Rafael. Thank you for your kind words, Otavio. But I am Brazilian, OK? <laughs> and uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm really honored for your words. Thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, it's, it's always an honor to be here at OJava. Uh, presenting and uh, sharing content. So this is really good. Yeah. So, uh, okay, uh, we, we will start here talking and uh, I'm going to uh, to share with you the, the presentation and uh, okay. So uh, today we're going to learn the concepts behind 10 Java challenges and elimin eliminate stressful bugs. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to present uh, Barry Evans again. He's from Ireland and he's the WJUG leader. He, uh, he, he's been at Java One twice. And do you want to uh, introduce me as well, Barry Evans? Sure. Can you go to the next slide, please, Rafael? Uh, hi, Rafael. Sorry. Can you go to the next slide? I am already. Uh, OK. Sorry. I, I'm still seeing the first one. Maybe I'm looking at something different here. Uh, yeah, no, actually, I can see the first one. Yeah. Sure. Maybe we can hit F5 to start the presentation. You are seeing the first one? Uh, yeah, I can see your, your PowerPoint. Just a minute. Ah, there we go. OK, that's better. Yeah. So yeah, Rafael, as you know, is the man from Brazil, and he's the creator of the No Bugs Project and the infamous Java challenges, which are on, uh, which he tweets about every day. So he's also the author of the No Bugs, No Stress uh, ebook, which you can get a copy of if you go over to the NoBugsProject.com website. 
And Raphael, I met him a few months ago uh, through the Dublin Jug. And he, Raphael is very interested in helping developers, you know, create clean code and use good practices so that uh, they can have less bugs in their code and have a, a stress-free life. That's that's the plan anyway. And one thing I did find out about Raphael after I met him was that he actually shares my daughter's birthday on the 19th of September. So it's, it's a small world. Yeah. So, uh, OK, let's uh, go on. What we'll talk uh, today is about the, the challenge and uh, we're going to cover generics, threads, strings, hash code and equals, crazy syntax, certain comparable, lambda strings, method overloading and polymorphism. Just before we start, Raphael, uh, I, I'm going to send a link out to everyone there to uh, an online uh, poll. It's called Slido is the name of the app. So if you click on that link, it should take you to the page. And um, as we go through each question, uh, you'll be able to, we'll give you uh, multiple choice answers and you'll be able to take a guess of what the answer is. And then before we show the answer, we will show the results of the poll. So if you want to click that link to the app to Slido event, um, that we'd be very grateful. Yeah, can, can we see the presentation? Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, you're still in PowerPoint, you're not in presenter view, so maybe you wanna click uh, present. Okay, so, uh, just a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will. Okay, so There we go. That's that night. Okay. So can can you see the challenge? Yeah, that looks good night. Okay, perfect. So this is the first challenge. Eric. Uh basically uh we are initiating the Simpson factory. So we are uh passing the Simpson class here into the the generic and we are passing in the constructor the Simpson instance. And uh, here on the constructor of the Simpson factory, we are receiving the Simpson object. And uh, here there is a, a method called add to list. And basically, we are passing new array list. And uh, another array list here and we are adding the objects that uh we passed in the in the first instantiation of simpson factory and then we are uh adding add to, adding to the list uh two array list and we are just uh printing the name Okay, so uh, basically it is this. Let's see the alternatives. So the first alternative is A, it will not compile. B will be Maggie. Uh, it will cause a runtime exception at line 32. Or D, uh, it will print Homer. So, Okay, let's see the answer. So the answer will be Homer because uh, we just passed the, the object Simpson and uh, we are going to just print the name 
of the instance. So at the top, we just pass the the instance of Simpson, and we are showing the Homer name. So nothing special here. We uh, we just use uh, generics, and as we are declaring T in the Simpson factory class, we can pass any any type of class. So that's it. Okay, thanks, Raphael. So can can I just uh, ask? Sorry, one thing. I think I'll be finished in a wee minute. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I just have my daughter here. Um, sorry, one second. Hi, sorry about that, folks. Just had a wee visitor come into the room. So, yes, uh, for this challenge, we're going to look at threads, you know, really important concept when it comes to Java programming. And uh, we're basing our example here on motorcycles. Uh, so we have a motorcycle which extends the thread class. And in the constructor, we pass in uh, the name of the motorcycle or the name of the thread. And then in the run method, uh, we increment this counter called Wolverine Adrenaline. And uh, you can see that it's initialized to the number 10 at the top. So um, once we increment the, the counter, we check if it's 14. And if it is, then the, the code or the program will output the name of the current thread. So in the main method, we can see that we create uh, a few motorcycles, first, second, and third, and we start them off. And then finally, we create a, a fast motorcycle and its name is last, and we give it a max priority because we want it to run uh, as soon as possible, uh, at the beginning if, uh, if possible. And we also make sure that it's set as a daemon thread. And after we set that flag, then we just start off the, the thread. And we want to know uh, what will be output to the console when we run this. So if you'd like to show the answers, Raphael, please. Okay, so A is gonna be the first thread. B indeterminate, we, can, we can't tell which thread uh, will uh, enter the if statement, uh, or will it be C, last, or D, third? So just before we go on, can I ask, uh, does it, has anyone been able to get access to the Slido poll? Okay, so I don't have any feedback there. Um, maybe we'll just go ahead and show the answer, Raphael. Okay. Please. So the answer is B, indeterminate. So the reason being is whenever we deal with threads uh, in Java, basically we can't, all we're doing is we're asking the JVM to start a thread uh, whenever it gets the next opportunity. So even if we set the, if you like to uh, hit the next slide there, Raphael, please, do we highlight the code, which is important? So the, the important code here is um, when we set the daemon flag, even though we set the max priority to true still, uh, or set their priority to max, we still don't know uh, which thread will be executed uh, first or in, any, in which order. And another thing is that when we set daemon flag to true, if, this is the only thread left to execute by the JVM, then it will actually exit the program. So in, in, a, in practice, this fast bike thread may never actually execute. So, and that's why that we may never enter the, uh, the F statement there. So that's it. Yeah. So, okay, the next one is the comparison string challenge. So this is uh, a challenge based on strings. And here in the first line, uh, can, can we see the cursor, uh, Barry Evan? Yeah, yeah, I can see it, yeah. OK, perfect. So here in the first line, uh, we have uh, this string uh, with the use of the tree method. And there is the same string here. And we are comparing if they are equals. And here, in the second line, 
we are comparing if flexible code is equal to flexible code. And uh, in, in the third statement, we are comparing if the new string do your best is equal to the string do your best. And in the fourth statement, we are comparing if the new string no bugs project is equal to no bugs project. Okay, so let's see the alternatives. So the first one will be two, three, six, and seven. So we have some options here. So let's see the answer. And then I'm going to explain you the concepts. So the answer is two, three, six, and seven. Why? So in, in the first statement, we are comparing if powerful code is equal to powerful code. And the answer uh, for the comparison is, is false. So the, the first, the first uh, answer here is two, because we are using the method trims. And this will generate another object. So it's important to remember that when you use strings, every string that are equals, uh, they are the same object. So every, every, all, every time that you create uh, a string, uh, you are actually creating an object. And this object will be inside the pool, okay? So uh, this, the, the string pool is created for performance reasons. Because imagine if you create a lot of uh, same strings and um, it creates a lot of objects. So it will cause a performance trouble. So we don't want this. Uh, actually, we want that uh, our our software uh, to be fast. So uh, when we use the tree method, we are creating another object. So in the first statement, it's false. So it's true. And in the second statement, we are comparing if flexible code is equal to flexible code. So in this case, uh, we are comparing with equal equal. So we are comparing actually the object and not the, the, the value. So in this case, as we are using the, the pure string without instantiating it, uh, it will be three, be true. And in the, the third statement, we are forcing the creation of another object. So even though they are equals, so new string do your best is uh, they are, they are, they were uh, supposed to be equals. Uh, they won't be equal because uh, we are forcing the creation of a new object. So here in this case, it will be false. So it will be six. And in the fourth statement, uh, we will be creating uh, a, a new string, but we are using the equals method. And when we use the equals method, we are comparing the value and not the object. So in this case, it will be true. So the final answer is two, three, six, and seven. Okay. All right, thanks, Raphael. Thanks for that. So the next challenge we're going to look at um, has got to do with collections and specifically maps. So you can see here we've created a, a little class called Start, and in its constructor we give the Start a name. And we've overridden two important methods here when we're dealing with objects that we store in collections. The first one would be uh, equals uh, to check if two objects are equal. Um, and to do that there, we use the name property of the Stark object. The second method uh, that we override is hash code, which, uh, which is used whenever you deal with uh, hash maps and other such collections. So as you can see here, we have an implementation um, using for hash code, which uses the name property as well. So in our main method, we create a, a new map uh, of start as the key and, and string as the value. 
Um, we create a few starts, Arya, Ned, Sansa, Bred, and Jamie, and we, we put those into the map one by one. And underneath that, then we just iterate each entry in the map, and we log to the console uh, the value of that entry. And the, the question is, what will be output to the console? If you want to show the answers there, Raphael, please. Okay, so the first one is one, two, three, four, five. Is it B indeterminate? We, we can't tell which order um, the values will be output, or will it be two, four, five, or five, four, three, two, one? So again, I just ask is uh, if anyone wants to register their their guests at the online poll, Slido. I don't see any activity on it. Do we have an answer, Barry? Uh, uh, no, I'm not seeing any answers. I'm not sure if. Okay. Uh, so uh, sure. let's just uh, explain the concept. Yeah, you just crack on. So again, you want to show the answer then? The answer is C. OK, so why is the answer C? If you want to show the next slide there, please, Raphael. So a couple of things here. Even though we implement the hash code method, uh, it's a bit of a badly implemented hash code uh, method because it will always return the same value, and that value will be uh, 1. Uh, the thing is that it's, it's just taking the name and doing a modulus on it. Uh, so we will never get a different value for hash code for any of the objects. But uh, whenever you use a, a hash map, even though we're using a linked hash map here as the implementation of the map, um, underneath it does use a hash map. And the hash map will first try and use hash code to find uniqueness. And then if that it doesn't give a unique uh, value for each object, it will then refer to or delegate to the equals method. And as you can see here, the equals method is going to use the, the length of the name of each Stark. So the first time we go around, we put Arya in, and then Ned, then Sansa. That's fine. Then it will come to Bran, and it will see that Bran has got the same length of name as Arya, and it will replace Arya. And uh, again, for Jamie and Sansa, uh, Jamie will replace Sansa. And, and that's why we get 245, because Arya and Sansa will be overridden due to the, the length of the name. So that's it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's it. So at this challenge, uh, we are asking you if it's going to compile or not. I know this code is really crazy, but uh, let's check it out. OK, so here the first thing uh, is the first strange thing here is the public street SP class. And is it going to compile challenge? So here we have a lot of generics. So A extends object, B, C, D, D4, D7, underline, extends hash map. Again, a lot of uh, generics. And OK. And then we open the class, and there are plenty of uh, generics here also. And we are initializing with a sterilizable. Uh, so. We are uh, instantiating, not instantiating exactly, but this is really st strange. And uh, there, here there are lots of uh, generics. And here there are a lot of uh, inner classes, class A, B, C, D, S, and more generics. And here is an annotation, super warnings. Here's a volatile int volatile attribute. And here is a strict SP. And here we are instantiating the inner classes A, B, C, and D. OK? And another thing that is really strange, and I can I recognize it, is about these four. So. We are uh, just uh, using uh, system out print ln statement inside the for, so it's really strange. And 
we are using also a native method, a static native method with more generics. And in the bottom, we are using synchronized method. Okay, so let's see the alternative. It won't compile at line 12, 17, and 19. And the other one, it won't compile at line 11 and 27. So see, it won't compile at line 15, 24, and 30. And D, it, it will compile. So let's see the answer. Yeah, and it will compile. I know it's it's uh, unexpected, but it will compile. We can uh, declare as many generics as we want. So here, uh, here in the top, we can declare uh, as many generics as uh, we wish to, and uh, we can use transient. We can use volatile. We can use the system dot out dot print ln inside the four. So this is uh, possible. Okay. The for looping will be uh, it it can be infinite if we don't put any condition here. So yeah, so a native method we can use also. So everything here is is valuable, uh, is valid, so uh, it will work, no problem. Okay, thanks, Raphael. That, that was a certainly interesting code. Uh, so <laughs> the, um, the next challenge we're going to look at again is around collections, very important uh, thing we use every day. And now we're going to look at a set. Uh, so we're big fans of The Simpsons, myself and Raphael. And uh, so we've got a little Simpson class here, which implements the comparable interface. Um, again, when in the constructor, we just give a name to identify the object, and we implement the compare to method, which is uh, it's just using the name property, again, to compare two objects, and we implement two string, and then also the equals method there. If you can maybe click the cancel button there, that occultar. Um, so we can see the equals method, Raphael. Seems to be in the way a little bit. Sorry? Uh, just at the bottom of your screen there, there's a little pop-up, Google Hangouts pop-up. If you could click the the blue text, uh, just to cancel. Just so we can't see the equals method. Ah, there we go. Thanks very much. Okay, so yeah, we can see the equals method also does a compare on the uh, the name property of each of the Simpsons. So we have a set of Simpsons, and uh, we just add Homer, Marge, Lisa, Barton, uh, and Maggie. We take a we take those Simpsons and we add them to a new list that we've created, an array list that is, uh, and then we reverse the list, and then we just want to. Uh, log each the name of each Simpson to the console and we want to know what will be the output to the console whenever we run this code. So uh, answer A uh, was Bart, Homer, Lisa, Maggie and Marge. B is Maggie, Bart, Lisa, Marge and Homer. C a slight variation Marge, Maggie, Lisa, Homer and Bart. And then the fourth choice is indeterminate that we can't really tell what order that they will come out to the console. Okay. 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 Let's see so, the answer. Yeah, let's see the answer, please. So the answer is A. And if you want to click the button again, we can see the, the code, which uh, really uh, is important here. So first of all, if you note there, we're actually using a tree set, which uh, even though a, a set is un usually an unordered collection of unique objects, uh, but because we're using the tree set, that actually gives us the ordering. And a tree set mandates that any objects being put into it implements the comparable, inter comparable interface. And that interface is uh, actually a functional interface, which is um, 
its definition is the compare to method, which returns an int. And as you can see in the implementation here, we're using the incoming Simpson object and comparing its name to the, the current object. So basically what that achieves is reverse alphabetical order because we're using the string, the, the, the compare to method from the string class. So uh, basically what happens is then we have a, when we add all the objects to the set, we have a reverse alphabetical order. We put these all into the list and then we call reverse on that list, which brings them into, in, in essence, uh, normal alphabetical order, and that's why we get Bart, Homer, Lisa, Maggie, and Marge. And the the equals method we put in there is just a bit of a red herring because um, the tree set doesn't use the equals method to sort the objects. It will rely on the comparable interface. And if you don't implement it, actually, it doesn't give you a compile time error. It's only at runtime that you would see any um, errors if you don't implement the comparable interface. So that's one to watch out for. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, that's it. So this is the Lambda challenge. And uh, we are basically uh, invoking two methods here using Lambda. So the first method is use revolver. And uh, we are, uh, passing uh, an instance from the revolver interface and we are uh, implementing the shoot method, okay? And in, in the second statement, we are uh, invoking the, the use shotgun method, passing uh, the, the the shotgun um, implementation. So we are basically implementing the shotgun interface using a uh, lambda. So instead of uh, uh, creating another class that implements shotgun, we can just create the lambda. So that's that's much easier. Uh, or we, we, we could create uh, uh, an inner class, an anonymous inner class that uh, implemented those interface and it would be uh, overriding uh, those methods, the reload methods. So basically we are invoking the lambdas. So the lambda on, on the first method use revolver, we are uh, just invoking the, the shoot method from the revolver. And the shoot method uh, basically returns a string. So we are just implementing the method, okay? And in the second method, use shotgun, we are doing the same thing. We are implementing the method shoot that simply returns a string, okay? And we have also a default method where it is reloading. It just reloads. So letter A, it won't compile at line nine. Letter B, it won't compile at line 24. And C, bund, it will be the the output from the guns, and D, it won't compile at line 20. So let's see the answer. So the answer will be the output from the gun. So here, we, what we have to, to keep in mind is that we can use lambdas only with functional interface. So what is a functional interface? Basically, it is interface that has just one method. For example, you can uh, use uh, comparator. Comparator is an example uh, because there is just one method. Or uh, you, you, you can think about runnable because runnable has only the method run. So it is a functional interface and it's very common to use lambdas. So the, the goal of using lambdas is about making our code simpler. 
because uh, you, uh, it's it's not required for you to to be to to be writing that uh, that huge code. For example, when we use used to use a uh, swing uh, with the actions in Java, we used to write that giant code. Oh, new action listener and a, a lot of uh, code. No, you you can just write lambdas because it's obvious that uh, when when you are going to when you are using a uh, um, this this kind of functional interface, uh, it's you you are because there is, there is just one method. Okay, so the trick here is uh, about the shotgun interface because there are two methods here. It's going to work or not? It will work because the default method doesn't count. For considering uh, an interface as functional, uh, we just we, we just we consider the public the the method that has to be implemented. Okay. So the shotgun interface is, is a functional interface. So it will comply without problems. So this is basically the trick on this one. Okay, just showing uh, where is the, the trick point, okay. Nice. Okay, Barry. Thanks, Rafael. Yeah. So, uh, another feature then of Java 8 would be uh, the Streams API, which is a very useful way to um, iterate over your collections. And again, we have a, a Simpson class here. This time in the constructor, we specify the name and the age of the, the Simpson person. And if we go up to the top in the main method, we can see we create a, a list, uh, a, an immutable list of uh, Simpsons. And uh, we create Homer, Margie, Bart, and Lisa, and we give them their respective ages. So what we do is then we turn the, the list of Simpsons into a stream, and we call a few stream uh, methods on the, on the stream. And first of all, we call a map uh, to get the age out. Then we filter the elements in the stream, and then we call, finally, the, the min, the min uh, method on the stream, and if there is something comes out of that, if the in the if present method receives something, uh, then it will go into another lambda expression, and uh, you can see there that it, it will do an iteration of an int stream, and it's using the Simpson uh, the Simpson age if it's available, if it's present, and then it will call the for each ordered method, and it will print out. Um, something to the console. And if you show the answers out, please, Raphael, the question is, what, what will be output to the console whenever we run this code? Uh, the first option is 35. So we're just going to see 35 in the console. Uh, the next option is, is it just going to keep printing forever? C, uh, it doesn't print anything at all. Uh, and the final uh, choice would be no such element exception, which is related to streams and optionals. Mm -hmm. Again. Let's see the answer. Uh, yeah, you can show the answer, surely. So the answer is B, uh, which prints to infinity and beyond. So uh, until you kill the JVM, basically, or your computer fan, uh, <laughs> it goes over overheats. So uh, if you want to hit the button again there, and we'll see the code, which is important here. So some of the main concepts, uh, if you're not familiar with streams, basically, it's uh, it's a really nice feature um, of Java 8 where you can set up a pipeline of operations, a bit like your CI, uh, CD pipeline whenever you're building your code. So we just uh, start off with a stream of uh, Simpsons, as I said, and we have two types of operations on streams. Uh, the first are intermediate operations, and the second are terminal operations. So you can specify as many intermediate operations as you want, and map and filter would be both intermediate operations. The good thing about the intermediate operations is they, um, they're they lazy, so they won't actually be executed. 
Uh, even though we have got four uh, objects in the stream here, uh, once we get to this terminal operation of min, uh, once that is uh, satisfied, then the rest of the elements won't be uh, passed through the map and the filter uh, methods. So uh, we can see here that the uh, the minimum of these, well, actually, if I look at it, the map, operation first, we're basically extracting the age out of each Simpson object, and then we pass it into the filter uh, functional interface, or the, sorry, the, the filter lambda expression, and we just only want to have ages which are greater than or equal to 30, so that, that gets rid of Bart and Lisa, so we basically now have Homer and Margie in our hand. And then as I say, the terminal operation will, will find the minimum of those two uh, objects. For those two values. So uh, that will end up with Margie. And then the if present method basically returns, uh, or sorry, the min method uh, returns an optional. And that gets given into the if present uh, lambda expression. The, the, if there was no value there, then the no such element exception would be thrown. Uh, but because we do have a, a value being passed in, which is the age of the Simpson, which would be Margie, 30 in this case, um, then what happens is the, the Lambda expression, uh, which generates or the int stream and just iterates from basically from 30 and it adds uh, one onto that uh, and it just keeps going over and over and it will then print out the uh, value again and again, so it will start 30, 31, 32, and it will just keep going because there's no upper bound on the iterate method of the int stream. This is a really useful way to play with, with streams if you just want to keep generating objects and uh, add some add some terminal operations or intermediate operations to, to learn a bit more about streams, so that's it. Okay. So this is the challenge about overloading. This is a tough one. So in the first line, we are uh, passing uh, an integer. The second line, we are passing a float number. The third line, we are passing a wrapper. And the fourth, we are passing a long number. OK, and we want to know uh, what is the, the answer? What is the output from x? Okay, so let's see the alternatives. Okay. So we have some things to keep in mind. So var args for uh, var args is those three dots. So it's basically uh, we, we, we can pass uh, as many value as we want. So if we can, if we pass uh, here, a lot of uh, number one, we could because it would accept it, okay? Also, we have uh, here uh, a wrapper, we have an object, we have a short, float, and a double, okay? So, let's see the answer. Okay, so the answer would be ES. C E. So I'm going to explain why it's E F C E. So one thing that is really important here is about uh, when the, the numbers. When we pass the number directly in Java, uh, it will be here. For example, it will be an integer. It won't be in a, a short number. So this is really important to keep in mind. For example, it's impossible. I I uh, I cannot pass this number to a short signature. Okay, I could if I use cat uh, cat, but uh, if uh, I use if I use the this this number uh, without cat, it won't compile. Okay, so when I use the number here directly. Uh, it's an integer, so it's going to fall into a float because an integer is not 
uh, wouldn't fit into a chart and it wouldn't fit into the varargs because varargs is always the last one, okay? And the second method, we are using a float number, but again, when we use the number like this, uh, the JVM will, will understand the, this number as a double. So that's why uh, we are having X. And uh, in the next method, we are evoking, uh, we are using the wrapper type double. So why does it not fall in, in, the, in the double signature, in the primitive type? Because the JVM is lazy. So the JVM will make the less effort as possible. So it's, it's much easier to, to the JVM just wide the double wrapper because, you know, double is an, is an object. So it's much easier to transform a double to an object than uh, making the process of unboxing and transforming the, the wrapper into a, a primitive double. So it's, it's much easier, you just wide. So the key here is to remember, the JVM wants to make the less effort and uh, it, it, uh, for performance reasons, okay? So this is the key. And in the, in the first line, we are passing a, 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 long, a, long, uh, a long number. It's going uh, to fall into the flow signature because there is not a, a long signature here, so the it will wide. It will wide to a flow. Let's see the key points here. So do you, we have to remember always widening, boxing, and boxing var art. This is the the order that uh, overload the overloading in Java works. So we have to keep in mind the JVM is lazy, and uh, we have to the JVM wants uh, will always take the less effort as possible. So we have to keep this in mind, and we have to remember widening, boxing, those bar arts. Okay. And here is the. Uh, is the order of the widening byte, short, int, long, float, double. The same thing as this graph here. Along, it will be widened to a float. Okay, Barry? All right, thanks, Raphael. So the, to wrap us up then, uh, we're going to look at polymorphism, which is arguably uh, the most important concept of the, the four kind of pillars of OO. Um, and here we have uh, another Simpson class here. It's an abstract class, and we provide an implementation of the talk method, uh, which will output the, the word Simpson to the console. So we have a few other uh, Simpsons here. We have Homer, which extends Simpson, and he has his own implementation of talk. Uh, Bart, obviously, he has his own catchphrase, Eat My Shorts, uh, and Lisa, who's a big, uh, big fan of jazz and the saxophone. So uh, in the main method, we, have a new, we create a new Homer, and we ask him to talk. Uh, a wee bit different, we create a Simpson, uh, which is a new Bart. And we ask that Simpson to talk. And then finally, we create a new Lisa and we ask her to talk. And so the question is, what will be output to the console when we run the main method? So if you want to show the answers, please, Raphael. So the first choice would be Simpson, Simpson, Simpson. Uh, and he's already shown the answer. So the answer is C. Thanks very much. Uh, so why is the answer C? Uh, maybe you want to ha uh, go to the next slide, please. So even though we have a, an abstract class here with the default implementation, which is the, the default access modifier of package private, uh, our subclasses, uh, Homer has got a, an a more elevated um, access modifier, which is public. So that's fine. That works for that. 
uh, and that will allow that method to be called um, using virtual method invocation at runtime. Uh, again, this, the same as for Bart. Uh, we can see that he has a protected uh, void uh, talk, which will then be be invoked at runtime. The thing about Lisa is she doesn't actually have uh, an override. She has an overload of the talk method, so that was a trick there. And in the main method, we can see that even though we create a new Bart, we the, the reference uh, type is a Simpson. But as I said, due to virtual method invocation that the JVM provides, even when we call the talk method, it will be on the Bart object rather than the, the abstract class, um, the Simpson. So I, I finally, as I said, the, the Lisa class doesn't actually provide a method overload. It's actually a method override. So that was a, a little trick there to see if you guys were paying attention. So that, that's it. That's the final challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So then the topics we covered were generics, uh, uh, threads, and strings, three very important um, features of the, the Java language. And then we had a wee look at the hash code and equals method uh, to do with the collections, the, the crazy syntax uh, that Raphael showed us, uh, which somehow, somehow or another it did compile. I've tried it myself. Uh, then we looked at the, the sorting and the, the comparable functional interface, which is good for uh, the tree set, interf the tree set uh, collection class. Uh, we looked at a couple of Java E features, which was lambdas and the streams API. And then finally, we looked at method overloading and then polymorphism, two important OO concepts in Java. That was uh, what we had to show you. And uh, we really hope that uh, you, could, you could learn something new. And uh, there is here uh, notebooksproject.com. And if you access there, you can get the free book, No Bugs, No Stress. So uh, uh, it will learn about how to avoid bugs and how to avoid stress, how to have a powerful code. Here are uh, our Twitter, Rafa Donero and Bazani, and to dubjug.org, you, uh, you can access uh, really cool stuff. Soon we will release some, uh, some videos with top developers, and you, you, can, you can access, you can learn a lot. And if you are here in Dublin, you, you can uh, uh, just come here because uh, there are always uh, golden content and learn a lot. Always. Barry? Yeah, yeah, that's true. So I've recently got involved with the Dub Jug um, community and it, it's really great. It's a good uh, Java user group. We have some really big speakers coming in, and you know, both myself and Raphael got the chance to represent the jug at uh, Java One recently, which was a great experience. We met many great people, and we do have a few big speakers coming up, uh, like the Nikhil, who is the the main committer of the Eclipse Collections project. So, if you're ever in Dublin, certainly look us up, and we're you're more than welcome to stop by. We'd be happy to host you. Yeah, and stay tuned at So Java because we always uh, will have uh, more videos and more content to uh, helping you in your career. And uh, I, I thank you for attending the event, and I, I uh, appreciate your your presence and. You, you, you can check this video later as well if you couldn't at now. So bye bye. And uh, I, uh, I really appreciate this moment. And do you want to say goodbye, Barry? Uh, yeah, just thanks everyone for tuning in. And again, um, we hope you learned something. We, we are big advocates of clean code and uh, you know making people's lives easier by knowing the the little tricks and the caveats of the J the Java language. And uh, yeah, we'll hopefully see you next time.
So right. thank you guys and see you next time. All right, bye.